Left wing versus right wing. Socialist or progressive versus conservative. This is the world of the political spectrum and increasingly political polarization in this day and age. So what would Hayek say? I'm Scott Nelson with the Austrian Economic Center and Hayek Institute in Vienna, Austria, and this week we're going to take a look at what Hayek has to say about liberalism versus socialism and conservatism. So I've mentioned on several occasions my love for Hayek's 1960 book, The Constitution of Liberty. Well, he ends that great work with an essay called Why I Am Not a conservative. So I figured we'd use that as a springboard to take a look at what Hayek has to say about liberalism as distinct from both socialism and conservatism. So one of the things that Hayek does in that text is he rejects a one-dimensional political spectrum. I mean, it goes without saying that Hayek was not a socialist, but it seems that he wants to distance himself from conservatism as well. He was concerned at the time when he was writing, in the 1950s and 60s, that conservatism was unable to offer any alternative view of what we should believe in and stand for. As such, it was simply being dragged along in the direction of socialism. Now, there are two things, at least, worth observing about this. For one, Hayek's understanding of conservatism might not map entirely onto our present-day use of the term. And that's not a problem, because sometimes it's precisely the differences between two time periods that can shed light on our own time. And towards the end of this video, I'll talk a little bit more about the way that conservatism has evolved today and what Hayek might have to say about that. The second point I want to make here is that Hayek's own philosophy moves in a decidedly more traditionalist direction later in his life, which is precisely some would argue the philosophy that he's criticizing in this text. So what problems did Hayek see in conservatism? Well, for one, conservatism fears new ideas because it has no principles of its own to oppose them. It is bound, therefore, by the stock of ideas inherited at a given time. Now, because it disdains the power of argument, according to Hayek, its last resort is a claim to superior wisdom, based on some sort of self-arrogated superior quality. But why would a philosophy disdain the power of argument? Let's stop for a moment and consider that. When you argue, you try to persuade the person you're arguing with uh, by using words. Now, one of the problems there is that arguing, and one could say more generally philosophy itself, is highly destabilizing. It forces you to re-examine some of your most deeply held convictions. There's another problem, rather, that Hayek sees with conservatism, namely its inherent suspicion of reason. And why does it suspect reason? It suspects reason because whatever can be built up by reason can also be destroyed by reason. Criticism has no built-in mechanism to prevent self-destruction. And at its most extreme, one could say that the relativism of our time is in fact an outgrowth of criticism. Two other points that Hayek raises in regards to the weakness of conservatism are, one, he feels that conservatives have a tendency to reject new knowledge just because they dislike the consequences, and that by refusing to face facts, conservatives actually weaken their own position. Finally, Hayek says that another weakness of conservatism is linked to its hostility to internationalism. Nationalism, he says, is different from patriotism. You can prefer and revere a society's traditions without being hostile to what is strange and different. So the nationalistic bias is a bridge, according to Hayek, from conservatism to collectivism, which is at the very heart of his criticisms of socialism. Now, that last point is worth dwelling upon for a moment. One of the conceits of the 20th century, which still exists with us today, is to see communism on the far left and fascism on the far right, as if they couldn't be further apart from one another. Now, one of the unfortunate side effects of viewing these political ideologies on a spectrum like this is that if you're on the left, say, and you view the right as bad, which of course I suppose you would because why would you want to be on the bad side anyway, then anyone standing to the right of you must also be bad, or at least believe in bad things to varying degrees depending on how far to the right they are. 
The other problem that can arise is that even though you find yourself on the good side of the spectrum, there might be people who are further in the direction of good than even you are. Now, you might even find them a bit extreme, but compared to the other side of the spectrum, they're allies, even if uncomfortable ones. Now, one way out of this conundrum is to take the Aristotelian approach and declare that virtue, or in other words, the good, lies between two extremes. And in general, I happen to think this is a rather good approach. But even that can pose problems, because you also need to have a clear idea of what the extremes actually are. Or is it possible, for example, that what appears to be the happy medium today is in fact already too far in one direction? But this isn't Hayek's approach. Hayek's approach is different. When he wrote Why I Am Not a Conservative, he was concerned that liberals, classical liberals, I emphasize, often find themselves on the same side as those who habitually resist change, i.e. the conservatives, in their common opposition to progressives and socialists. He did not think that classical liberals or libertarians should try to occupy some happy medium, though. He thought that the one-dimensional political spectrum was all wrong. In fact, a closer representation of reality, he thought, was a triangle, with socialism in one corner, conservatism in another, and liberalism in the third corner. So, how is liberalism then distinguished from socialism and conservatism in this new political spectrum, according to Hayek? Well, what socialists and conservatives share in common, according to Hayek, is collectivism. In fact, when I mentioned the 20th century conceit that communists and fascists are at opposite ends of the spectrum, Hayek actually thought they shared quite a bit in common. In any case, liberals are equally distinguished from both groups. How? For one, socialists and conservatives both fear uncontrolled social forces. Socialists and conservatives share a common hostility to competition and desire to replace it by a directed economy, either in the interest of the oppressed or of one's own nationals, for example. In the case of conservatism, this fear is related to two other characteristics, says Hayek. Its fondness for authority and its lack of understanding of economic forces. Socialists and conservatives have fewer qualms about arbitrary power as long as it's used for the right ends. And as long as government is run by the right people, then it needn't be restricted by rigid rules. Socialists want leaders from the underrepresented or the economically oppressed groups, and conservatives want leaders who are wise, or increasingly also the underrepresented conservative groups. Liberals, by contrast, are less concerned with who governs and more concerned with how one governs. For Hayek, the liberal is as far from socialism's crude rationalism as from conservatism's mysticism. The liberal is fundamentally a skeptic. The liberal is not anti-religious, but believes that his own spiritual beliefs should not be imposed on others, and that the spiritual and the temporal are different spheres which should not be confused. Moral and religious ideals are not proper objects of coercion for liberals, and this is perhaps why, according to Hayek, lapsed socialists tend to find it easier to find a new home with conservatives than with liberals. Now, what's interesting about all of this is that it is precisely this vision that seems so unsatisfying to so many people on the left and right today. The individualism of liberalism, the unwillingness to impose values on others or to change the culture, so to speak, the limited room for rationalism, the fact that liberals are comfortable with undesigned or free growth and change, so in other words, with not directing growth and change, but also not preventing it, and finally, with the liberals' commitment to internationalism, or to what is increasingly being called globalism today. Now, there are many reasons why this kind of liberal philosophy is weakened, so allow me to enumerate just a few of them. One of the most underappreciated reasons is that liberal philosophy has actually been remarkably successful 
it's allowed people to live and express themselves more freely than ever before. And, as you'll hear from many a libertarian, it has brought economic prosperity to millions around the world. However, despite its successes, or perhaps even because of them, there are still problems. Not everyone is happy. Perhaps people expected liberty to bring them fulfillment. Socialists, progressives, people on the left generally would say that liberalism has failed to solve, in a timely manner, some of the most pressing issues of our time, be it climate change, racism, inequality, etc. They may even articulate their argument in liberal terminology. So in other words, that you cannot enjoy, for example, formal liberty until you have secured the real liberties, such as higher pay or greater economic equality, etc. On the right, people would say that liberalism has failed because it's too materialistic, or that it's too unwilling to discuss spiritual or religious issues, that it's too focused on the individual as if the individual were just an atom, detached from any community or traditions, particularly a national community and national traditions, and that it's therefore too international-minded to make room for nationalism and the nation-state. But like progressives and socialists, nationalists and conservatives today might also articulate their argument in liberal terminology. They might say, for example, that we can also speak of a country's freedom, which includes being free from certain international organizations, for example, such as the UN or the EU. Now, to make good on Hayek's call for a robust and imaginative liberal philosophy, which I outlined in one of my previous videos on why intellectuals love socialism, will require a defense of liberalism on many different levels. And in a future video, I will start by looking at Hayek's definition of liberty. Let me conclude for now by saying that Hayek's liberalism is beset by difficulties coming from many sides. It's not without its weaknesses, some of which I have mentioned. It calls for individual responsibility, a tolerant attitude toward rationalism, but not too much rationalism, especially when it comes to remodeling society. Perhaps most challenging, though, is that it asks that we not impose some of our deepest convictions on others, even when, especially when, we have the power to do so. Does that apply when our deepest conviction is liberalism itself? It's a paradox of liberalism a principle both uncomfortable and difficult to defend. But there are some principles which are always the same, and which must therefore always be defended, no matter how unfashionable they become. And that's what Hayek would say. This guy is awesome. He's got a lot of great stuff to say. I hope you've really been enjoying our videos. If you have, and if you'd like to hear what Hayek has to say about something else, anything, then let me know in the comments. And please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with your friends.